So I think we are ready to get started. What do you think, Lonnie? I am ready. Thank Great. you. So we have we have a lot of people that are we have uh, over three hundred already, and we've got a few more people that are going to be joining. I know lots of people RSVP'd, and people are very excited. We also are broadcasting this live on our Facebook page. So our Facebook, of course, at Busboys and Poets, uh, you're welcome to go there also to watch it. Uh, we'll be taking some questions a little bit later, and we'll be also doing some polling with you all. So this is going to be a fun, relaxed evening. Uh, kick back, enjoy, uh, grab a drink or anything you're eating or whatever you're doing. This is going to be a conversation between myself and the uh, one and only Lonnie Bunch. And I'm so excited when we were thinking of doing this series, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we continue these types of conversations. And, and Lonnie, I don't know, of course, you remember, uh, you know, when you were interviewed by Amy Goodman for the launch of your book at Busboys and Poets, which was only a, a few weeks prior to uh, the, uh, the shutdown. That was a really fun night. It was a great night, and I have to be honest, you know, who knew what was going to happen over the next several months, but it was one of the highlights of my book tour to be oh, no. in with you and to be with her. And um, I'm always so amazed that people care what I do. I'm always touched by that. Well, you do such wonderful things and you have such a great, generous spirit about you, I think, Lonnie. I think that's what really attracts people to great leaders. Um, I wanted to ask you, of course, where, you know, this is a very unusual setting, right? We're having dinner together, but we're not <laughs> together, uh, you know, and uh, we're, we're, uh, apart from one another, as many people are apart from one another. Uh, how are you faring up with this? Are you, are you in this state where you're just uh, going crazy and you want to get out? Or are you kind of chilling and taking it one day at a time? Well, if I could get your fried chicken every night, I'd be really <laughs> cool. Um, I think like many of us, you want to make sure everybody's safe. Um, but you want to really find a way to separate work life from home life. And now it's all bleeding together. Whether I get up and start taking calls at seven in the morning or they go until eight or nine at night, I guess the best thing is that it's forced the 19th century historian to figure out how to use technology. Uh, there you go, you know, and sometimes, yeah, you know, uh, what is it, what is it? Uh, desperation is the mother of invention or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, I, I've never understood this work-life balance thing, I have to admit, because as an entrepreneur, as a person in business, you know, I don't know what that means. Right. Uh, it, it does, does it really mean something? Does it really, I mean, I, I know that, that people are going to hit me hard on this one. They're going to say, ah, you're just you're a full of it. But, uh, but, you know, the idea of a work-life balance, what is that? I think that the reality is for most people who love what they do, who are committed to their craft, you know, it doesn't end at five o'clock or it doesn't end on a Saturday or a Sunday. What it is, is you just have to realize that at some point, you got to stop and just find a little joy that's separate from your work life. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that you have complete separation, but every now and then I try to find a little joy, things that make me laugh or smile. My problem is usually most of my joy comes from reading history, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but every now and then. For joy. I mean, obviously reading history is, is something you enjoy. You, you became a historian. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But what do you do for, for joy? What do you do for fun? Well, if I wasn't a historian, I'd be a filmmaker. I love film. So any chance I get to watch old movies um, from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, I was staying up late one night to watch some bad film noir from 1949. So for me, film is the great escape. Well, you know, it's interesting because the DC Film Festival is on right now and they're doing it online. So every week they release a new film and you can actually watch it for free. And it's been wonderful. We saw DC Noir, which is a great series of little films. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but it's a great way to spend an evening. I think it's a great way. And I like the notion that it's free. Yeah, exactly. That's always, <laughs> always nice. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 you know, it's interesting with the Zoom thing, a lot of stuff has become free, like, you know, a lot of conferences, a lot of get togethers, uh, people aren't charging for it, which that sort of takes the edge as well for, for some, obviously. Well, I think what, what, what this situation we're in means that there's going to be a lot of new normal, that things that um, we didn't do before or things that were unusual are now going to be the norm, right? I mean, I think that so many people are comfortable getting their content digitally. So that means places like museums and other places need to do that. It's clear, for example, what you're doing with this series at dinner 
there's a great thirst for people to be able to touch each other, even if it's just intellectual. Um, and so I think that's going to continue long after we get a vaccine. So in some ways, what we have to recognize is so much of what we're dealing with will become part of our lives. I, mean, I know as a historian, I won't give you the whole lesson, but you know, I could look at the yellow fever epidemic in Columbia, New Orleans, or the flu in 19, 18, 19, or the fear from polio in the 50s. All of those changed us. We didn't know how we were gonna be changed. So I think we just have to recognize that we're in a period of ambiguity, but we will be changed. And, and what do you think that change will be? I mean, I, I know some of it might be, uh, some of it might be negative, uh, but some of it, uh, hopefully, a lot of it will be something positive or something you know different at least. Uh, what do you think? What do you anticipate that change will be? Do you think people will? Well, I mean, I know we've gone for thousands of years uh, evolving into social animals. We 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 long for connections with other people, and we long for the hug. We long for the touch. We long for all these things. You know, a few weeks, I would imagine, is not going to change our evolution uh, in that direction. But what do you see will be the most uh, significant changes that you imagine, other than the use of technology, of course, as a, as a way to communicate? But I think that part of it is the question you raised. Um, how does it change our social interaction? Um, you know, we're used to coming together in large groups. Is that going to be something we're going to be able to do um, until there's a vaccine? I'm struck, for example, about museums. One of the great things about museums is they bring people together who don't know each other, who rally around an artifact or an exhibition or a public program. Suddenly, if people are scared of interacting with people that aren't their family, what does that mean? So in some ways, some of it is negative, but I would argue a lot of this is about how creative we are in reimagining, yeah. reimagining the opportunities, just like you're doing tonight. Um, we might not have thought about, I might not have thought about doing this, but in this light, in this environment, it says, what are other ways we can reach out and find ourselves stimulated? So I think, you know, I have great confidence in our ability to reimagine and to move forward as long as we recognize that we have to reimagine. Absolutely. Uh, what do you miss the most about not, not having uh, quote unquote normal? Uh, what, what, what is the thing that, that, you wish like, gosh, you know, as soon as this is over, I'm going to do this. Well, as soon as this is over, I'm going to bus boys and poets. Um, <laughs> that was a good answer. Okay, <laughs> next question. <laughs> but I think that as soon as this is over, what you want to do is find the things that were most normal in your life. So can you go back to movie theaters for me? Um, can I get together with groups where we just tell the stories that we laugh? For me, so much of life is like, oh, the barbecues we used to have when I was a kid in my backyard. People would get together and Uncle Joe would say something and Uncle Mac would say that's wrong and it'd be humor. I want that sort of freedom to be together again. I think yeah. that's what I want to rush to find out once we get through this pandemic. What about you? What do you want? Well, you know, I... I... I love movies. I mean, one, one of the things, I'm like you, I, I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so you wanted to be a filmmaker, uh, but, but I I, um, I long for for being able to go out. That's kind of our default uh, when we want something to do, but we we just think of it in the spur of the moment. It was just let's walk to the movie theater. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's been that's been a really nice escape uh, for us. Um, I long for having uh, open mics. I love open mics and poetry and having them in person. I, I miss that a lot. Uh, I miss having friends to sit in front of and, and have long, deep conversations with and, uh, you know, just have a good time with. So I, I miss those things, you know, and, and uh, yeah, this, this is something, but it's not the same. Right. I, I miss the, the laughter and the storytelling that comes from intimacy. You can do it over the of using technology, but there's something about the intimacy that makes the joke funnier or makes you share a story deeper, um, and that's what I that's what I miss. Like like for instance, you wouldn't know that I'm not wearing pants right now. <laughs> for instance, <laughs> or okay, that might be too much information. <laughs> uh, now you you grew up in Chicago. 
No, New Jersey. In, in New Jersey, but but you spent some time in Chicago. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, what your your is it your grandfather uh, was a sharecropper? Yes. And and uh, did you get a chance to meet him? Did See, you know I was very fortunate. Um, my grandfather died the day before I turned five, so I remember it like it was yesterday. And he started out life as a sharecropper um, and decided that that wasn't what he wanted out of life. So he found a way to go to a historically black college at night. It took him 10 years to get his to graduate. Then he decided he wanted to come to New Jersey from North Carolina and be a dentist, right? I don't know why, but he, and he, he said, well, I've got to go to Howard. That was where you go to dental school. And Howard said, well, you've got to be able to pay for a whole year before we'll let you in. So he and my grandmother moved to Atlantic City. She did wash in the hotels. And he did in those days, they had something called rolling chairs, where they would hire college educated black men to push rich white people around so that they would have conversations. So he did that for years, saved his money to go to Howard, got his dental degree and then moved to New Jersey. So for me, he and my grandmother were examples of how individuals can trans can transform up the project trajectory of your family that uh, I could still be chopping cotton in North Carolina but because of him you know I ultimately became the third generation of my family to graduate college because of he and my grandmother so I always marvel at when people say to me oh the individual doesn't matter you can't change your destiny I look at my grandparents and say here they were one generation removed from enslavement and they've transformed a life that they couldn't have imagined. To me, what is amazing about that is how they could imagine a life that they had no history of, that they had no way to understand that that was even possible. Um, that's the one thing I wish that they had lived longer so I could ask those questions now. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because when you opened the museum that day, uh, the African American Museum, you had four generations? Or was it, was it, was it, was it a four generation family, right? Yep. That were there that opened up, and that's an incredible thing. I think the 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 uh, the the oldest was like ninety nine years old or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we had four generations of families that were there to help us celebrate. The oldest was ninety nine. In my own family, my mother, my daughters were there, and my granddaughter at the time was there. So for me, the museum is really about remembering, but it's about families. Yeah, it's about recognizing that. The stories of Frederick Douglass and others are great, but equally important is the story of your and my family, because that's the stuff of history, and that's the stuff that a country's built on. So, so you decided to become a historian. You, you went to Howard University, then you went to American University. Yep. Um, what, what made you want to take that on? I mean, obviously, your family history, and you wanted to, to, to know more, but lots of people may have that kind of family history, but they choose to do other fields. What made you interested in going into history? Well, two things. Um, this grandfather that lived, that lived and died before I was five, he one day was reading a book to me because I couldn't read. And it had pictures of school children. And um, he said something like, this picture was taken 100 years ago. More than likely, these kids are dead. And I'm like, kids that look like me are dead? And then he said something that shaped my whole career. He said, isn't it a shame people could live their lives, die, and all it says is unidentified children. And I was taken by that. I wanted to know what people's lives were like. I began to look at photographs and begin to try to imagine, were they happy? What was their job? How were they treated? I realized at that moment, I couldn't articulate it, but I became fascinated by making those that are invisible to history more visible and giving voice to those that have been anonymous. And that's really shaped my career. And the other thing is, History is the only thing I'm good at. So uh, you, you sort of also figure out, okay, um, you do what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the, the late, great Howard Zinn uh, used to say that it's not the history that you tell, it's the history you leave out, is by how you tell history sometimes. And that's how history has been told in, these, in the United States, of course, uh, for, for many, many years. I think that what I've been struck by is once I got this letter from somebody once who was critical of the work I was doing, and he said, don't you know that forgetting is America's greatest strength? And for me, I really think the power of the past is not just 
backwards, but it's where we are today and it's inspiring us. And to me, history is the most amazing tool to live your life, to give you guidance, to figure out how we got to where we are and how we can inspire future generations. When I look at history, there are moments I get very mad, I throw books, I get angry, but most of the time I'm inspired that people believed in a country that didn't believe in them, mm. that people demanded a country live up to its stated ideals, um, and that for me it's a constant battle to make sure that people understand, for example, things like the Confederate monuments are really about how the South lost the war but won the peace. Um, and so for me, it's really trying to make sure people understand who we once were, who we are now, but, but point us towards who we can become. Mm. I, I, I remember we have, a, we have a place out here in the Shenandoah Valley, and sometimes we come out here, and I remember going to a coffee shop here one time. Uh, this is uh, a, a few years ago, uh, pre-Trump actually. Uh, and we, uh, we went into the coffee shop, and it was early, early in the day, and the woman that was behind the counter was making coffee, and it was just my wife and I, and uh, our oldest daughter was there, and we were sitting at the counter and we ordered coffee. And as she was making the coffee, I turned around, and I see a Confederate flag at the window. And so I'm not one to just ignore stuff like this. I always like to engage people at some level. So I said to her, I said, can I ask you a question? Can you tell me why you have a Confederate flag? It's offensive. I said, why would you put it up there? And she said, well, you know, I have to differ with you. It's our heritage. And I said, well, but if your heritage offends so many people and it's so uh, demeaning to a lot of folks that are consider themselves American as well, don't you think you should remove it? And, uh, you know, and she, you know, had a very cordial conversation with, you know, with me and my wife. And uh, I left a very big tip, just wanted to make sure, you know. So <laughs> when we left, I remember driving by about a week later and the flag was gone. Really? And I was like, wow, a conversation. Who knew? Now, now that's they impressive. Take it down to clean it or, or, or maybe bring a bigger one. I have no idea. But it was down the day I drove by. I think it's amazing. To me, I don't ever want anybody to erase history. But what I want people to do is get the accurate history. So if yeah. you want to celebrate the Confederacy, I'm fine with it if you say, hey, we were traitors. We lost the war. Um, and if you admit all that, celebrate all you want. Move on. Uh, so <laughs> let me ask you this. As, as a historian, you study a lot of people in history and so on. If you were to bring somebody back uh, and be able to sit down and have dinner with them, uh, who would that be in history? Somebody who's already gone. It would be Frederick Douglass and Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay. And if I had a third, it would be Jackie Robinson. Okay. And uh, so can you elaborate a little bit? So I think that Frederick Douglass is probably one of the most important figures of the 19th century. Um, this notion of Douglass sort of reinventing himself, being this kind of self-made man, but also being somebody who fought not just for the rights of African Americans, but for women. Um, and I just think he would be an amazing person to sit around the dinner table with. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt strikes me as the example of how women are defined in a certain way, and yet she broke out of that mold, and she became, in some ways, the conscience not only of her husband FDR's administration, but the conscience of 1950s and, and early 1960s America. The notion that here is this privileged white woman who said, I want to use my privilege to find fairness and social justice. That amazes me. And Jackie Robinson, good gracious. Um, you know, to be able to both hear the stories of what he went through, but maybe he could finally teach me how to play second base. I'd be the happiest guy ever. Is that one of your favorite uh, exhibits at the, at the museum? Do you... I, I think that, you know, it's like asking yes, was my favorite child. But right. I must admit, there were times that I would, when I was sort of under tension, I would go into the sports area and just watch that acrobatic creativity, just watch what has really been done despite the odds. Um, you know, to go sort of watch the, the film footage of Muhammad Ali, 
or you know to see Wilma Rudolph. I, I just find sports both challenging to write about and think about, but obviously inspiring. Somebody, somebody is, uh, has made comments. They said they would want Prince. They want to have Prince back to have, to have dinner with. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, if I have a long table, I got a lot of people I'd like to have back. Right, exactly, exactly. That would be an incredibly long table and wonderful. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you this. You're, you're obviously spending a lot of time at home, as many of us are. Um, how do you get your news? How do you, how do you keep centered? Uh, do, you, do you get it from television, from uh, uh, blogs? You, where do you get your news from? Okay, now you're, now you're getting deep to who I am. Well, first of all, I still get the newspaper delivered. I like that notion of getting yeah, you up know, in the morning. Buy online, you get the delivery of the paper for free. So that's, you know, that's, my, that's my deal, too. Uh, you know, yep. so therefore, I, I love the notion of picking it up, going out, thinking about what, what I'm going to grapple with. Um, a lot of it, I get a lot of blogs because I'm very interested in the interpretation of what I'm seeing. Um, and I'm a sucker. I still watch local news at 11 o'clock um, oh. because I think that one of the things that I've never forgotten is that when I left Washington the first time to go teach at the University of Massachusetts, I remember watching local news and they were talking about, you know, a fire in Roxbury or this, whereas in DC, local news was national and international. And so I've always been fascinated by that juxtaposition between stories about Anacostia, stories about the White House, stories about international. So I get my news that way. And then when I'm really missing something, my two daughters tell me what I should be looking at. <laughs> do, you, do, you tweet, uh, do you tweet a lot? Um, the secretary of the Smithsonian tweets all the time. Uh -huh. Lonnie Bunch tweets regularly, but not all that often. I see. Um, on, let's stay for, for a minute on, on reading. You get your information a lot. You were saying that you read a lot of history books. You were, you were telling me that earlier. Uh, I, I know, you know that's obviously part of your job, but uh, are you a fiction or nonfiction kind of person? I'm a nonfiction, but my fiction is poetry. Um, I never go anywhere without a copy of the collected poems of Langston Hughes. Never. It's just something I carry with me all the time. Um, I keep a poems by poem? Georgia Douglas Johnson. What? Oh, I said, do you have a favorite poem of Langston or do you just? Sure. It's that? real simple. It's a poem where he wrote, he said, Lord, how I wish the rent was heaven sent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so, so poetry obviously is, is something that, that bodes uh, highly with you. Do you, do you write uh, poetry? Do you, do you? Um, I, I have written bad poetry. I, I want to know your artistic side. Do you, what is, what is that, what is that part? Is there? Uh, uh, you know, I have written bad poetry, bad fiction. Um, what I realized is I'm better at a, as a, as a nonfiction writer. Um, when I go back, I've always kept journals for years. So when I go back and look at my journals from when I was a freshman or sophomore, that I, writing poetry I thought was really good. It's amazing how bad that was. <laughs> yeah. If it rhymes, it's great. But, but since you're not acting, are you writing? <laughs> am I writing? Uh, I am writing, actually. But my writing is, is you know, it's a uh, work in progress. I, I keep uh, trying to figure out, uh, you know, I try to journal once in a while. Uh, but I'm not that disciplined, I have to say. You know, people that journal, uh, they say they have to do it every day, and it's painful, and it's work, but I, I don't do it uh, as often as I'd like to. Do I'm compulsive. I will, do, I will do journals, but I won't do them every day, but I'll do them like a sprint. So oh, I'll do yeah. it for, you know, three days to catch up. Yeah. But, um, you know, I was able to document the building of the museum through the journals, um, and now I'm documenting the challenge of being a secretary through journals. Um, eventually, I'll, I'll uh, share those with my kids. But uh, they're really for me to sort of contemplate and reflect on kind of where I am and what I've tried to accomplish. I know we're, we're doing this engagement online, obviously. What's the Smithsonian doing? That's, uh, I know that you, you can see a lot of the exhibits now online. Uh, I know. And, and I don't know, if, you know, we, we didn't really set this up clearly because uh, you, of course, were the founding director of the African American Museum, and now you became the head of the entire Smithsonian Institution. Uh, the, um, 
you know, which is a huge, obviously, undertaking. And um, now the the museum is all the museums are under you, including the one that used to direct. And your wife works uh, for the uh, for the American Indian Museum, correct? My wife is the, is the one of the associate directors at the National Museum of the American Indian. So as they long have, as they don't, as long as they don't close museums, I'll be okay. You'll be fine. So you're her boss. Oh no. <laughs> 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 I'm her colleague. Her colleague. Okay, I got you. If she wants to say hi to us, tell her to come say hello. Um, she will. But, She'll come on in. What's What's the museum uh, up to? What, what What are you guys doing to engage uh, your your? How many people did you have visit per year for all the museums? Oh, you, probably thirty million people. Thirty million. So that's a lot of people that are missing out now, right? Well, um, I think so. I I think that what is clear is that the Smithsonian already have been asking the question, how do we serve even more? I mean, yeah. I love the fact that people, I mean, I love to go into the museums and watch people engage, but I realize there are millions of people that won't get to the Smithsonian, and yet I'm always struck by the wonders of the Smithsonian, by the amazing creativity of the staff. So what we're doing now is recognizing that so many people are much more comfortable receiving their content digitally. So we've crafted something called Smithsonian Cares, which gets out educational material for teachers, for parents that are homeschooling. We've asked people to put out little mini, sort of mini lessons, if you will, on different parts of science or history or art. And that in essence, what we want to do is recognize that though the Smithsonian buildings are closed, our expertise, our ideas, our passion is still there to share with people. And so I think mm. it's important for us to recognize, and I believe this strongly, cultural institutions are really the glue that holds a country together. And they're also the glue that I think is so crucial at a time of fear, at a time of stress. So what I hope the Smithsonian will do at this moment is continue to do what it's done well, provide insight, provide context, provide entertainment, provide understanding, provide the challenge, and just maybe provide a little hope. That's what we try to do, even if, even if the buildings are closed. That's fantastic. Uh, and 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 uh, and before I know that the African American Museum had a huge uh, number of people come and visit. How many people were visiting that museum per year? Well, we had thought about four thousand people a day. We were getting eight thousand people a day. Wow. Um, and what it tells us is that there's an appetite in America, even though sometimes we don't see it for the truth, an appetite to understand the complexity of this country that we live in. And the fact that um, the African American Museum has not only one of the most diverse staffs, but one of the most diverse audiences really tells me that there's a large segment of America that wants to understand itself better and recognizes that you can't understand who we are without understanding how the African American experience was central to who we are as Americans. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an a, a incredible museum. And I know that uh, there's, a, there's a, the average, you were saying the average number of hours that people spend at, at a museum is what, about an hour and a half or so? Right, and but, what happens is that 90 minutes is roughly what people spend, but at the museum, the African American Street, we're spending four to five hours. Uh -huh. um, and so that was part of the reason for the crowds. But what it told me is that people we're engaging not just with the artifacts or with the exhibits, but they're engaging with each other. I love the fact, let me tell you one quick story. I was walking in the museum and there was a woman talking to her maybe 12 year old son about Megar Evers, the great civil rights leader from Mississippi who was murdered in 1963. And she was telling him in detail about um, what his life was like and what the sacrifices he did and when she finished, another woman came up to her and said, I just want to thank you for sharing that. And the, the mother said, well, why? And the other woman said, because Meg Evers was my dad. And so to have those kind of moments, that's what museums, that's what the Smithsonian can provide. You, you also tell the story about, about getting some of the, uh, the historical materials for Emmett Till. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? <coughs> One of, the, one of the most moving parts of the museum 
was, is really the way we've interpreted Emmett Till. And it's a story that goes back to my time in Chicago. I was president of the Chicago Historic Society, and one of the people I was very close to was Studs Terkel, the great oral historian. Mm. And whenever I would meet Studs, I'd say something, he'd say, here's who you need to meet. And he said, you need to meet Mamie Mobley, Emmett Till's mother. I didn't know she was still alive. She came to my office, and we were supposed to have an hour and a half lunch. She spoke for seven hours about what happened from the time she kissed her son goodbye to the time she buried her son. Mm. And I'm crying, I, I, I'm overwhelmed. But I was so fascinated by this woman's courage. So we became friends. I wrote some things about her in the Chicago Tribune. And one day I was at her house and she said she had carried the burden of Emmett Till memory for 50 years. And she thought it was my turn. Mm. And I never forgot that. When she, went, when she died shortly after that, I came back to the museum. And then when, because of a horrible mistreatment, because her, the original Emmett Till casket was discovered, not being taken care of, the family reached out to me and said, we know you care, would you help preserve this casket? So my first thought was, should we collect the casket? Is that ghoulish? So we preserved it, but I wasn't sure we'd ever interpret it. And then I kept thinking about Emmett Till's mother, that the story was not just the broken body, but the courage of this woman to at the darkest moment of her life, to demand that that cast could be open so the world could see what they did to her son. And through that pain, she brought power to people who wanted to change America. So we decided to craft a spot that would allow the public to sort of feel the pain, but feel the strength of this woman. And so for me, that's one of the most sacred spaces in the museum. It's an extremely moving exhibit, beautifully done, really. Very well, I, don't take credit, I don't take credit for anything. There are gifted curators, designers, you know, I just have ideas and they make it work. It takes leadership, that's for sure. So, you know, some of the comments that are coming in, they're saying that, you know, we've come a long way, but we still have a long ways to go. We've just seen the murder of, uh, of a young man who happened to be jogging in his neighborhood get killed by two white men, a father and his son. Uh, and, but for the video uh, that came out, uh, they may have gone completely scot-free, uh, which is really quite shocking. Uh, I mean, maybe not so shocking, but certainly uh, quite disturbing uh, in America today. So many well, years. That what you've really put your finger on is first of all, the price of liberty, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, is to make sure that people are held accountable. But you also realize that how much has slipped through the cracks? How many of those moments weren't captured, weren't seen? Um, and so in a way, I think the challenge is to recognize that the America today is different in many profound ways than the America where I was born. But that doesn't mean the America today is at the promised land. It means that we have methods to demand the country live up to its ideals. We've got people who can have positions of influence to shape and demand that fairness. But it means that we will always have to confront evil. And one of the things that I think is so powerful about what you've done with Busboys and Poets is that you've really changed the city. And what you, by that I mean is what you've done is help people understand how central to understanding the city is. It is central to understand how you fight for social justice, how you understand the past, how you look for fairness. In some ways, what you want are people like you that demand America look at itself clearly and carefully and to be able to confront those who don't want to change support those who demand change, and definitely demand a country live up to its ideals. Very well said. Um, I wanted to ask you, for, for somebody who's, who's, let's say, who's coming in new to this and learning about history and American history uh, in, a, in a new and uh, enlightened way, what books do you recommend that they uh, seek? Uh, what, what, uh, what are your favorites? Well, you can never go wrong with Howard Zinn. Um, you could never go wrong with John O. Franklin from Slavery to Freedom. I think there are um, bra some brand new um, biographies of Ida B. Wells, who is one of the great figures in America that most people don't know. Um, I think that it's crucially important to look at a lot of the work that's being done on slavery, on the, pri the prison system. Um, 
And I think in many ways, the great opportunity is that over the last 20 years, we've had amazing scholarship in African American history and history generally. So now you can find the stories that need to be told. Um, so I'm really proud of the profession because the profession has said, we're not writing for antiquarians. We're writing to change a country. And so, so much of the work that's being done um, is doing just that. What are some of your favorite films that deal with these issues? I know there's been so many that have come out uh, in the past decade, um, at least, and uh, it'd be uh, what, well, what- You know, anything Ava DuVernay touches, you know, has been spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, but there are even old films that are not spot on, but are really important. I was watching Henry Fonda and the Oxbow Incident, which is about a lynching. And it really was a sense to say to America, if you don't have a law that treats everybody fairly, here's what happens. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a Spike Lee guy, so anything that Spike does, I watch. Um, and I think that one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen is Daughters of the Dust. Uh, I, I, so, so for me, there's a lot of movies like 13, um, um, the movies about the Central Park issue, Central Park Five. So in many ways, what I think is powerful is you're finding stories that are painful and tell the truth. You're also finding stories that illuminate people that we don't know. Um, there was just a four part series on Madam C.J. Walker and whether historians you know, will debate how accurate it was, it's a fact that suddenly you're having people um, being introduced to a whole raft of folks who don't know these amazing stories. So I'm pleased about that. But to be honest, one thing I've realized since I've been home is as I've you know, watched Netflix or whatever, it's amazing how many bad, mediocre movies get made that take the space for good movies that would look at social justice or issues of race or gender. So even though there's more, it's still a paucity compared to what there should be. Absolutely. Um, I want to pivot a little bit, and, and we want to ask uh, we want to ask a, a few questions of our audience. So we have a couple of uh, polling questions that we'd like you to uh, to answer, and we're going to launch the first poll. Uh, which museum uh, will you be visiting first after after all of this is over, after the green light is given and the museums are back and open again? What would be your favorite uh, museum to visit? Which would be the first one to visit first? We're going to launch the poll. And we encourage you to, to answer uh, at your leisure. So uh, we're going to keep it open for a little bit. Uh, so let me, let me go back to the museum a little bit. I know uh, the museum opened on September 24th. Uh, 2016. Right? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the, the year. Um, Obama was president still at that time. Uh, it was a very, uh, you know, interesting time in American history. Obviously, we were going through the election and we didn't know what the outcome of the election was going to be at that moment in time. Um, can you reflect on that day? I mean, I'm, that must have been an incredibly moving day. It, the museum, the, the, the original legislation that was signed for the museum was what, 2005? Yeah, um, 2003. And I came back in 2005 that was, to work. That was George W. Bush, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So when I, I think about when I think about that day, I think about what we wanted was that day to reflect not just the museum, but reflect the America we expected. Um, with obviously President Obama, but I also wanted President Bush there because candidly, early on there were a lot of people who didn't want that museum on the mall, and George Bush actually stood up and said that museum should be on the mall, which helped us make sure when we went to Congress and others to say, but the president wants it on the mall, that helped us get it on the mall. Um, and so when I think about that day, I think about what we were trying to convey, which is first of all, the sense of amazing history and continuity, that there were so many people who were touched by that history. And when I was unbelievably nervous, unbelievably nervous, um, because I thought, we had worked for this day for 11 years, and now it was actually here. Um, and suddenly all that work, um, would it resonate with the audience? 
would people come out to do this? And when I went out on stage and saw those tens of thousands of people along the mall, I'm already crying before we do anything. And then to hear John Lewis speak how this is part of the culmination of the civil rights movement, to hear George Bush give what I think is the best speech ever, talking about how America has to confront its, its racial past. Um, I couldn't believe this speech, honestly. I, I was there that day, uh, and, I, and I remember it slightly, but I just listened to it recently again, and I just like, it blew me, it, it really blew me away. I mean, the fact he called Nat Turner a hero, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that was like, what? where did that come from? Wow, you know? I think what that tells you is part of the power of museums is the ability to educate everyone. Um, and I, I think I, that- I know who Nat Turner was. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that what really hit me though, two things hit me about that day. One was the emotion of, the people on stage. That here you've got president, I mean, they do great stuff, but they recognize how important it was that this museum on the mall would mean that the mall was forever changed, would mean that the story that has shaped America that is often neglected is now front and center. Um, and for me, the most moving part was I was walking to the podium and I was terrified. I, I, I was losing what I was gonna say, I was really nervous. And then as I got close to the podium, I heard people calling out my name, Lonnie Bunch, Lonnie Bunch. And I realized at that moment, they weren't calling me. They were calling my grandfather, who was Lonnie Bunch the senior, my father who was Lonnie Bunch the junior. And it, re it made me realize that what this museum did, while it celebrated those who were well known, it also introduced so many people to many people who were famous only to their families. Mm -hmm. And so as I sort of felt my father and grandfather with me, suddenly my nerves went away. That's what I remember most. Yeah, it was really moving. I mean, some of the speeches, even hearing like uh, Stevie Wonder uh, when, he, when he spoke and talked about it, you know, the, the divisiveness we have and all this, and I'm thinking like, I, I wonder what he's saying about today. You know, I mean, that was like, that was mild stuff then, you know? It's, what what was it like? Uh, I, I mean, I I know you had so many stars. There's Oprah Winfrey. There was Will Smith. There was Robert De Niro. There was uh, uh, Angela Bassett. I mean, Bassett, you know, was, part of the part of the challenge was it was almost harder to open the museum than to build it, right? <laughs> because you had to figure out who gets to speak. Right. At first, people were like, oh, I want to speak. It's my turn. Um, but really figuring that out. I mean. To be honest, one of our big supporters, one of the people I admire the most is Oprah Winfrey. Um, she supported the museum. You could see that she cared passionately about it. And watching she and Will Smith interact was oh, just- that was, really, that was um, really cute. You know, and then to hear Patti LaBelle sing my favorite song, oh, The Change Is Gonna Come, um, I was just blown away completely. And what I remember most is as she finished this, she said, a change is gonna come. And she yells, that change is Hillary. And I remember President Clinton jumping up. <laughs> Who knew that, you know, several months later, it wouldn't be Hillary. It'd be a different story. It'd be a different story. So, so when, you opened, when you opened the museum, I know that was the day, was the big opening day and so on. Were there, I know that behind the scenes isn't always what's in front. You know, what it was in front was this beautifully orchestrated, beautifully done, flawless event. Uh, are there things that you wish you had done, people you wish you had been on stage that had talked? Are there, are there any backtracking to think, I wish I had done this, or wouldn't it have been nice if we did that? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, remember that this was really done by a lot of my staff, people like Kinshasa Holman Conwell and Tasha Coleman and so many others. They really thought this through. Who should speak? What's the protocol? But also what we did before we opened. One of the most amazing nights was when we invited the families of people who donated artifacts to the museum. Mm. So to see grandmothers taking their granddaughter and saying, that's from our family, um, that to me made it really amazing. special. And so I think that, you know, what I wished is that we could have had many more nights for average people to come in and to enjoy it. Uh, you know, we did a lot of the donors, what you have to do. Um, 
But I think that was special. And I'll tell you the one regret I have is, you know, we also had an amazing um, folk festival that went on a couple days before we opened. Great music, Chuck D. I was so busy, I didn't get the chance to do any of that. Um, if I were to do anything differently, I would. I think it was, you know, the, everybody who participated really wanted to participate. I thought having the Bushes and the Obamas, and especially at the end, having that family of four generations ring the bell, the bell that for some people symbolized freedom, for other people it symbolized um, sort of working on a plantation. For me, and if you could hear carefully, there were bells ringing all over the country at that same time to celebrate and to remember all those who have shaped the country, who no one knows their names. That to me was one of the most powerful moments. Yeah, and, and then of course, you know, you were, you were the director there for a couple of years and then you were tapped to be the head of the entire Smithsonian. And that must have been really hard to give up, you know, your baby, so to speak, and be able to move on. Uh, what, what advice did you give, uh, Spencer crew when you were leaving? Well, first of all, it really was the hardest thing. I, I, I really wanted to stay as director of the museum. Um, it was the most special, I had, I, had, I had family there, right? The people that worked there were my family. The way people would react on the street, uh, people would come up and hug me and say thank you. Um, and so to me, it was the best place and it also had the best office in the world. Um, you know, when President Obama came through, he said, wait a minute, your office is better than mine. <laughs> and I said, I said, you've only worked eight years, I worked 11 years. Um, <laughs> you know, to give up that office, to go to the castle. But I realized something. The reason why I did it is working on the museum was our gift to America, all those people working on it. But I also realized that the Smithsonian, as an institution, profoundly shaped my life. It's where I met my wife, my kids went to preschool there. I found not just a career, but a calling. And I realized that if I were secretary, there's nothing I need. So I can give everything to give back to the institution that shaped me. So this was really my gift to the Smithsonian. Um, and it's also because of something that happened that I had completely forgotten about. There was one year we were going to visit my mother's family in North Carolina um, over an Easter break. And it was during the time of all the celebration of the centennial of the Civil War. And we're driving and suddenly we're hitting Richmond and Petersburg and there were all these museums. And I said, oh, I'd like to stop. And my father always had an excuse. I have to get gas, we gotta get further down the road. Um, and so on the way back, I said, okay, I'm gonna plan and give him plenty of warning, but he never stopped. Then instead of going straight to New Jersey, he pulls into Washington, pulls into the Smithsonian and said, here is a place where you can learn about the past and not have to worry about the color of your skin. Because mm -hmm. he knew we couldn't get into those museums, but I didn't know that. And so for me, the Smithsonian, even as a 13 year old kid was a place of possibility was a place of fairness, was a place that if it did its job right, could really provide understanding. So this was my way to repay an institution that meant so much to a 13 year old kid. And what did you tell Spencer when you were leaving? I know he's the interim, he's the interim uh, director right now. And uh, he was of course a, a George Mason University history professor there and you tapped him to be- And he, and he, was, the, and he was the director of the Museum of American History. Yep, yep. What, what, I sim what I simply said to Spencer is, trust your instincts and lead, because this is a museum who has to be as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. And then I said, and don't screw it up. <laughs> so, so we just got the poll for the first one. So we have 59% said they'd go to the African American Museum, not surprisingly, right after this. Uh, the second, the second highest is the uh, is the American History Museum. Uh, the third um, is the American Indian Museum and the Anacostia Community Museum. We're tied. Mm -hmm. and then the Museum of Natural History. Then the Air and Space Museum, which is kind of surprising because that was one of the most popular ones, right? 
Yeah, and it's still the most popular Smithsonian Museum. Interesting, interesting. So, so we have we have another poll that we're going to be sending out, um, or actually a question. And this is a question that we're asking people that we're asking them not to Google it because it's unfair if you do that. So uh, obviously, because this is a, this is a question about the founding of the museum. What year was founded? Uh, so here is here is the poll. We're going to launch it, and uh, you can uh, just give us your answer, and we'll give you the uh, the comments back as soon as we get it. There's a few questions that we have from our audience that I want to be able to share with you. Um, they said, um, I had mentioned earlier about the idea that Howard Zinn says, what do you leave out uh, is what tells history a lot. And somebody's asking here, um, in the museum contest, uh, was there a difficult situation you were involved with uh, of removing some artifacts or things that you uh, had to not show for whatever reason? Uh, you made a decision, this doesn't really belong because we don't have the room for it or for whatever reason. Well, I think that first of all, all museums make choices, right? Curators determine what stories they tell, what artifacts are gonna embrace that, help you embrace those stories. Um, and so I felt that there was no story we couldn't tell in the African American Museum. We had to tell it in a way that would engage the public, that would help us introduce them via certain artifacts. So um, there were things that we felt were very difficult for people to see, Ku Klux Klan uniforms, but we felt it was important to share that and contextualize it. So there are things that I wouldn't do that just celebrate the brutalization of the black body. I'm not gonna do things like that, but I want people to understand that history as well. So I think that the Smithsonian, the Museum of, the Museum of American History, African American History, their job is, as John O. Franklin used to say to me, to tell the unvarnished truth. And sometimes the unvarnished truth hurts, and sometimes it inspires. Mm. So let me bring the best museum person I know. All um, right. This is, this this is my wife, who hello, is the how are you? associate director. You know, say hi. Hello. Hello, it's good to see this you. Is, yeah. This is rare. We don't do this. You know, oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So, so is, he, is he your colleague or your boss? I want to understand this. Oh, I'm his boss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We said that clear. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and, uh, and tell us, you, you work, uh, Maria, you work at the, at the, at the Museum of uh, the American Indian, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. And, what do you do I, there? Can you share with our with our audience? What do you do there? I you have work? The, um, the division of museum learning and and public programs. So I oversee everything from the visitor services staff who greets the public when they come in, to volunteers, to the tour guides, uh, to education and public programs. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. That's a gorgeous museum. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so course, much. Almost as good as the African American. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I wanted. Uh, there's there's another question from from Phyllis Bennis, who is the uh, she's a she's a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. I'm on the board of that organization. Full disclosure. She said that she had been to the museum a couple of times. She has not been able to see Dr. King's Riverside speech, the Beyond Vietnam speech, where he talks about the triplets of commercialism and militarism and racism coming together in this uh, you know, perfect storm uh, that, he, that he talks about. Is, is she, she's asking, she said, did I miss it or is it not there? There are parts of it that are referenced in the media piece looking at King, um, but we don't have, you know, I really wish I had the speech, um, but we basically tell the story, but not as in much detail. Uh-huh, um, some other questions. Um, Somebody's asking, in light of what we're seeing here with the, uh, with the COVID-19 and this uh, pandemic, uh, and, and you've studied history, what lessons did you learn from the 1918-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, the flu, uh, the Spanish flu, that you think may or may not apply to today? Well, I, I think that what you first learn is that a nation will be changed, so that you've got to embrace ambiguity. You can't just hold on and say, we're going to get back to normal. There's going to be a new normal. And I think that 
feeling comfortable helping to redefine what that is, that we don't know exactly what it is, but we've, but we've got to have confidence that we will change and we will adjust to people's fears, people's needs. Um, I think that's what I've learned more than anything else is to embrace ambiguity. I think the other thing is, is to make sure that the Smithsonian, the Museum of American History, African American History, Indian Museum, Portrait Gallery, that they're all collecting this moment. This is one of the most important moments in, in American history. And I wanna make sure that 50 years from now, it's not forgotten. And that people can find these stories that will allow the public to understand this world that we're living in. So I'm excited about that. Um, but ultimately, I think that what I wanna make sure is that we remember the loss, that we remember the disparities, we remember the unfairness, and hopefully use that to challenge this country to do a better job. I wanted to, to share the results of the last question that we asked, what year was, was the Smithsonian founded? Can you give us the answer? Oh, can I? Yeah. Oh, I, you know, if I screw this up, 1846. <laughs> 1846. So, so 1846, we have it here. Uh, most people said 1846, but it was a close tie to 1865. So, so uh, we had uh, actually 42% said 1846, 37% said 1865, 17% said 1946, and 4% said 1965. <laughs> I think it's, to me, what's so powerful about the Smithsonian is that it's been around for almost 175 years. Yes. And in some ways, what it really means is part of my job is to prepare it for the next two or three generations so that the Smithsonian is a place that matters, not just to people of a certain age or not a certain demographic, that it really is a place that says, if you want to understand who we are, this is the place for you. If you want to understand the challenge of climate change, this is the place for you. If you want to understand the opportunities of exploring space, this is the place for you. So that what I want to make sure is that the Smithsonian is always a value. Value in traditional ways, values in non-traditional ways. Because the Smithsonian is a trusted source. And at a time when we're hearing so much noise that we're not sure what we can trust, the Smithsonian ought to be the place that says, here is the loud horn of truth. And we want you to be able to, whether you come via digital or come through the space, through the podcast, we want you to know that this is the place you can count on. Well, it is, uh, and you mentioned this before many times, but it is our ministry of culture. Uh, most, most countries have a ministry of culture and, and uh, we don't have one and the Smithsonian is the closest thing we have to that. Well, I think that, you know, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, what nations are doing around the world when it comes to culture and the Smithsonian has to play that role in sort of helping to push culture and work with other museums here, but also to help think about cultural policy. Um, and also to sort of say, do we have a responsibility to help when there's an earthquake in Haiti? Of course we do. Um, and so my notion is that the Smithsonian has to be of service. And if we're of service, then we really are helping a world be made better. Do you, do you worry uh, right now because of, of course, all of the, uh, the budget cuts that are bound to take shape uh, that the Smithsonian will be adversely impacted in a, in, a, in, a, in a serious way? How much of your money comes from private donors as opposed to uh, public well, money? Well, roughly you say that 67% to 70% of the Smithsonian comes from support from Congress and 30% from private. Now, it's different for different museums and the like. But that's a rough way to look at it. Uh, I think that there's no doubt that this is going to have a profound impact on all the resources that the Smithsonian has to bear. Um, because we've been closed, all the restaurants, all the shops, you know, there are millions of dollars a week that we're losing. Um, and a lot of that money supports staff, it supports research projects. Um, but then even the federal government, there's no doubt that you're going to hear that the federal government is going to say, well, we've got to cut budgets. You know, they're spending millions and billions of dollars. Um, and so our challenge is to 
have some foresight to make some decisions, some that are hard, but my goal is to protect the staff, protect the core values of what we do at the Smithsonian, and continue to make sure that we don't tread water, but that we continue to do important work that helps the country. But it means there are gonna be hard decisions um, over the next several years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we also had, had, a, had a question that we're going to actually ask first, but uh, we want to ask, just get a sense of them from the audience. Uh, have you visited the uh, National Museum of African American History? How many of our audience that are listening right now or watching uh, have visited the museum? So we're going to launch that and see what the results will be for that one. Um, we wanted to ask just a couple more questions. What, what role, I know you have a very sensitive position, obviously, and, and you have uh, some some politics, obviously, that have to play into your role at some level. When some? You, Did you say some? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to be kind here, uh, but but I'm 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 trying to see when when uh, when the current president that we have toured the museum. I know you were by side. Um, has he been to the museum since? You know, um, I don't think he has. Um, I know that. Mrs. Trump uh, has been to several of the museums, um, American history, natural history. Uh, I think that what you want people to realize is the Smithsonian is this great resource regardless of politics, but right. that clearly you have to be political. Whether If you're a museum director in Washington or a museum director in Chicago, you've got to understand the politics of it. So it's not enough to be smart. It's not enough to be a scholar. You've got to be able to figure out how do you work the media? How do you work effectively with political leadership? Um, how do you work with boards? And recognize that I believe that you're always gonna get beat up for something you do. So you yeah. might as well do the good stuff, do the right stuff, fight the good fight. Um, because if you're gonna get beat up, let's get beat up for something big, not for something little. Make it worth it. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, um, I, I, mean I, I think when I think about you and the work you've done, you know, thinking about um, expanding busboys and poets, but really seeing it as both a business, but also as a service to the community. So I'd be curious, is that part of how you thought about as you began to create um, this wonderful empire you have? Uh, well, empire is an interesting way to put it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it really was. I mean, for me, it was something that was missing. Uh, that I wanted to have uh, a place we can go and and get a real uh, uh, sort of uh, a cultural experience uh, that I thought was missing, especially in DC. I always thought that DC just never uh, really kind of asserted its character to the rest of the United States. You mm -hmm. know, when you go to New York, you know exactly like New York has a feel, has a vibe. Uh, you know, Chicago has a vibe. Uh, uh, New Orleans have a, has a vibe, uh, LA has a vibe, but DC always had this other side that was overshadowed by the federal government. And it never really asserted itself, although people in the city knew who they were and what they were, but no one else kind of sensed what that, what that vibe was other than the federal government. So I wanted to create a place that felt like DC. I wanted people to come in and stop saying, this is so New York. Because I was getting tired of hearing that, frankly. Mm -hmm. I want people to come in and say, this is so DC, you know? That was well, kind I, of my, my I think answer. that's what's so powerful about what you've done, though. I mean, I think that the challenge of helping people recognize the tension between the federal city and the rest of DC is really important. Um, and one of the things that I felt that the Smithsonian needed to do a better job of was to be in Washington, DC to help people who come to the Smithsonian understand this amazing, complicated city, um, to make sure that the Smithsonian, as many of the museums, the Portrait Gallery and the, and the Smithsonian Art Museums, do a brilliant job of working with the District of Columbia Schools. I want more of that. I want to, as we say my family, take care of home first. Mm. Yeah. And that's what you do with Bus Boys and Poets. You take yeah. care of home. Take care of home first, absolutely. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few questions, and I, and I don't want to hog up all of your time. We'll be finishing in just a couple of minutes, but there's a few questions that ask about the architecture of the museum. And I know that's a big story, 
And I was just, just listening when I heard the Corona, I'm thinking, oh my God, what a name. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and, and you'll elaborate on that. Can you tell us a little bit about the machinations that went into the design and how some people wanted it a different color and how that became an issue as well? And how you- yeah. how I, I think up. what we wanted was we began to think the staff, you know, what should a building that houses this great story, what should it look like? Um, and we realized that we didn't want to do a building like everything else on the wall. And we wanted to set a sense that history is not passe, but it's modern and today. And so all I knew is I said, we wanted a building that um, would speak of spirituality, uplift, and resilience. We wanted a building that had a darker tone that would always remind Americans as they walk through the mall that there's always been a dark presence in America that often got undervalued or underlooked or overlooked. And what we wanted was coming back from Chicago where architecture is so key, we wanted a signature green museum. We wanted to set the standard that any museum must be sustainable. And we wanted a building that would enrich the mall, but enrich the architecture of Washington. And so we came up with this idea, and it really had many, if you will, mothers. Um, there, were, there was a Yoruba post that had angles that looked like that the building is. I also saw a photograph of Black women in the 1920s in prayer, and their hands were at this angle. So we knew we wanted someone that spoke of uplift. And then um, the architects came up with sort of what would be a bronze corona, this wonderful basically putting a building within a building. And that um, when we looked at it initially, we realized that you can't have solid bronze, it's too reflective. So the architect said, well, you know, maybe we'll just use a computer to do sort of wonderful holes to make it green. And I said, we're paying too much money for holes. So what I said is that, let us look at the ironwork made by enslaved craft people and free craft people in New Orleans and in Charleston in the 19th century. And that's what's over the entire building. So that filigree um, is really something that reflects different light at different times, but it also reflects the fact that so much of America has been built by people who will never know. And this was our way to thank them and acknowledge them. I was, I was fascinated to read that one of the uh, one of the submissions by one architect was to turn it into a black power fist uh, to make it look like the building was going to look like a black power fist. Well, that, that was that was early uh, before the process. Somebody sent me 150 drawings of it in the shape of a black power fist. And I remember thinking, there are many things I could probably convince Congress of, but I'm not sure a black <laughs> power fist is one of them. That may not be the one. That may not be the one. Well, I, I wanted. I, I know we have we have lots of questions and lots of uh, folks. I'm sure this this conversation can go on forever. But uh, you've inspired so many people, uh, you know, Lonnie, and so many ages and different, you know, from all different walks of life. Uh, you're you're such a positive person. Like you come across as being one of the most optimistic people I know. And uh, what inspires you? What what makes you wake up every morning so inspiring and so upbeat? Well, I think what inspires me is family. Um, watching, reading, learning more about my own family and the struggles they had. But really history inspires me. I read a story about how family struggled when they went from Mississippi to Chicago and found Chicago not to be the promised land, but yet they turned that disappointment into a small business that began to transform their family's life. Or I'm moved when I read history and see people crossing racial lines to demand fairness in America. I'm very struck when I look at photographs of black women and white women coming together to protest lynching. So for me, I am always inspired, not by the pain of the past, I don't ignore it, but I recognize that that pain has hurt us, has caused loss, but that pain also should push us forward. I have a great deal of hope that we can change this country for the better. 
But even if I'm wrong, the most important thing is the struggle. And so I'm always inspired by looking at history and seeing that struggle. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lonnie Bunch, uh, current secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. And you've been a wonderful friend and a great inspiration. I really enjoyed uh, spending this hour with you. And I hope uh, everyone else that joined us uh, will also. This is uh, our inaugural event, as we mentioned to you, for um, uh, busboys and friends. And uh, we consider Lonnie one of our friends, for sure. Uh, next week, we have uh, none other than Angela Davis. Uh, we will be sending out information on that. And we hope that you will register and join us to be able to be part of that conversation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for the polling. And let me just, the last poll that we asked is, have you visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture? 88% said yes, and 12% said no. So um, those 12%, I'm sure will end up going there once it's open. Thank you so much, Lonnie. My pleasure. Good to see you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.